start with a confession. This past Monday, I, John Van Sloten, broke the third commandment, big time. This commandment. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Or in the version I learned as a kid, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. On Monday, I broke the, th- the third commandment, and I did not say a word. i just gotten home from Sacramento. I was tired. It was Monday. It was my day off. Fran decided she was going to go up and watch a three-hour lecture for her school work, and so I'm all by myself, and I, I can't read. I can't think. I need entertainment, right? So I go on to Netflix, and don't really feel like watching a movie, just an hour of entertainment. So I thought, oh, I'll find a comedian, right? Because they have these great shows of comedians. And, uh, you know, I've seen all the Russell Peters ones already, so what am I going to watch? And I come across this comedian who I, I'd never heard of before named Louis C.K. Does anyone know Louis C.K.? Stick up your hand in peril. <laughs> yeah. Um, a bit crude at first, increasingly crude as it went along. Uh, But I continue to watch because I figure, although I'm a man of faith, supposedly, um, I'm also mature enough to separate what's genuinely very funny in terms of what he does and what's crude and lewd and I, you know, that part of it. What a ruse. So anyway, it gets worse and worse and worse and about a halfway through the program, I get nailed right between the eyes. He's... uh, He's making fun of Christians who say they believe that God created the world and then proceed to go and trash the world ecologically. And I'm going, yeah, well, that's a pretty good point. And uh, you can make jokes about us on that front. But he goes on to do that bit by comparing God the Father coming back to earth one day like a father, an angry, angry father, coming back to the house and finding the kids had left a huge mess and angrily and with rage yelling, putting in the mouth of God all kinds of F-bombs and worse aimed towards the kids who were leaving a mess. And so I just kind of grabbed the mouse and clicked and felt a bit of shame. And after about five minutes of shame, I go, really, God, every time I preach one of these Ten Commandments, I have to live out a breaking of that command in order to have a good story? A living parable. Now, you might be thinking, but Pastor John, you turned off that comedian when he got to that point, and you you certainly didn't say anything. How could you have broken the third commandment? Louis C.K. did. Yes and no. While I didn't say a word, I still broke the spirit of the command by watching a show that led me to a place that I probably shouldn't have been there, been in in the first place. How so? When I was younger, I was taught that the third commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, was only about blaspheming God by using the actual word God or Jesus in an inappropriate or sacrilegious way, right? So in our church, you know, where we would never do it because we were a huge Ten Commandment church, if we, you know, hung around with kids from other churches who would say, oh God, or something, like we would just be aghast, Right? in our Christian Reformed church that smoked and drank in our church. Um, But man, they said, oh God. And that was what taking the Lord's name in vain was all about. I've since learned in preaching on this command earlier and, and then again understanding it again this week that there's a lot more to the third command than just taking the letters of the name of God, God, Jesus, Yahweh, and misusing that literal name. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. In the Bible, when the word name is used, it means the person's name, God, Yahweh, Peter, John, 
but it also carries a greater weight and understanding. It also means the character and the being and the essence of that person. So when babies were born, they would often name them based on what they were observing about the character or nature of the baby. Even in even larger terms, the idea of the name of someone, um, it, it, it's even bigger than their essence or their being. It, it, it speaks about uh, who they are, their presence. So in the Bible, in the Psalms, you'll often read that we glorify the name of God. It's not the word Yahweh that we glorify. We glorify the character, the being, the nature, the essence, the presence of God, or we dishonor His name. So, to, and, and to take something as in vain in biblical terms, if you look at that word, the Hebrew word for vain, is to take it for unreality or for being empty. So what this commandment is saying is, don't take me for granted, don't live as though I, I am an unreality, don't define me, God, as empty in your life. Or more positively, Understand who I am and what I do. Know that I am more present and more real in your life than you can ever imagine. See me, hear me, touch me, feel me, everywhere. Take your everyday ordinary life, the Apostle Paul writes, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around, comedy-watching life, it's there in the Greek, and place it before God, as an offering. And what I did on Monday was make a bad offering of my life in terms of the choice I made. The choice of the kind of comedy, not that I chose to imbibe in, but that I chose to continue to watch for half an hour as it got cruder and cruder and cruder. Long before God, or Louis C.K., put profanity into the mouth of God, I was dissing God by finding enjoyment, too much enjoyment that was appropriate for me in the comedy that he was presenting, in the lewd language, and especially with his kind of comedy, the image-bearing human being demeaning stories that he told. His way of being funny is by showing how absolutely idiotic and self-centered and lewd and crude human beings are. Now, it of course was so good <laughs> because it was so true of me. But engaging the humor as he destroyed what a human being should be and how they should react, I was being destroyed in laughing about the, the total self-absorption that he was evidencing, I was kind of dissing the image of God in me. See, the joke really was on us. And when you as a human being denigrate the image of God, this amazing thing that he's put upon you, a calling, an innately good thing. You, you image God. When we take that to places, to shows, to things online, to activities in our lives that destroy or put down what it could be, we're, we're dissing God's character and calling on our lives. His name is being dragged through the muck. And then the joke is on Him. You see, God made you for way more. He made you for the highest of highs, to share in His glory eternally, perfect, to be holy as He is holy. That is ultimately what me, I, so it's what me is made for and what you guys are made for, is that kind of glory. And so, and this kills me all the time, right, because of what I do, right, such a public uh, confession of that calling, I guess. And I tell people about that calling, and yet out of the same mouth that can I trust, I know, preaches fresh water, God. How can salt water come out of that same spring? 
Louis C.K. in the 30 minutes I watched, twice said, okay, that's the lowest I've ever gone, and the crowd laughs. And it, like what he just said was so low, <laughs> and I laughed. When we take God's name in vain, we live as though God isn't there. I sat in my chair and vibing in something that wasn't the best for me and wasn't even thinking about who I was sitting before. And when I do that, and I do that all the time, I make a mistake, I sin, and I fall short of the glory of God, the way that I'm meant to image his name. I forget. You forgot the God who gave you birth. They forgot the Lord their God. They forgot what He had done, the wonders He had shown them. I mean, so many wonders, so many amazing God moments, and I forget. They soon forgot what he had done and did not wait for his counsel. They forgot the God who saved them. Yet my people have forgotten me days without number, God said through the prophet Jeremiah. They wandered over mountain and hill and forgot their own resting place. How can we forget God? It seems ridiculous if you hear that question straight up. And yet, how can we fail to remember that God is perfect and holy and we're called to bear His image and to be holy like God is? It's impossible, but I mean, at least how can we forget that that's the end? That's the direction you're called to, I'm called to. I sometimes swear in order to look cool and not be that kind of pastor who would never swear, who gets put on a pedestal, and so I have so reacted to never being that guy, that pastor, that my pendulum often swings in the other direction too far, and my language gets out of line. So we had a new couple from New Hope Church over to our place about three years ago before the Metallica book came out, and we were studying the book together, and it was great, and I don't know, I went off on some crazy story when I was a real estate developer when you were allowed to swear a lot more. It was expected to swear. And anyway, I told the story, and I used the language that I used when the story first played out in front of these new people, this new couple and these other people there. And though I felt that even in, in the saying, one of them was Amber Robichaux. Who knows Amber, right? Okay, salt of the earth, right? Pure, of God. She's not. She's not perfect. She's human like the rest of us, but she's just... she takes care of kids in the church. She's gentle. She's good. She would never use that kind of... Anyway, I I thought, oh, I shouldn't have said that in front of her. And then as she's leaving the meeting, and I don't know how she did it. She's clever. But in the course of our conversation, she parrots back the words that I said, the bad words, back to me as she's heading out the door. You know, well, you wouldn't want it, da-da-da. And I was undone. (laughs) And saying that story now, how how can it be that I can be undone when somebody who I think should be called to more, this woman who has small children, she can't use that kind of language. (laughs) And yet you, and I can't fix it. I wrote this sermon and that story down, went to a pastor's meeting on Friday and I did it again. How can I live as though you're not here and you're not attentive and seeing me or hearing these words, hearing your words? And forget the words, knowing your thoughts. I live never giving God the time of day, as Paul wrote in Romans 3. This is who I am. And if you don't think it's in you, uh, think a bit more. 
And if you know what's in you, hear this next verse. Even though we are this way, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you, God says. See, I've engraved you on the palm of my hands. In our ignorance and sloth and busyness and mindlessness, while we were yet sinning, God says, I will, I choose to forgive you, which is the power of the story that we're all living. Even as we're messing up and undone and un unable to get out of what we say or think or choose to do, he says, I'll never forget you. The realization of that fact is where grace lives and where I find hope to get up every week and do my job. It's the only remedy for your unending forgetfulness of God. And know that God has never, Grant, taken your name in vain. He has never, Andrew, forgotten you, your name, who you are, the unique, beautiful, mindful, image-bearing person that he made you to be. He's never spoken, Christine, of you in a disparaging way, wouldn't even come across the mind of God to talk about you in any way that doesn't honor you. Never poked fun of you. Curtis told jokes behind your back about those unique parts of you that are different. Never thought less of any of you than he should. Always is mindful of you and attentive toward you and aware of you and present to you and has you in his heart all the time. Everywhere. All the time as you lie on your bed and think those thoughts. As you surf the web and go to those sites as you, in your anger, act out in that way, as you say, see, hear, those things. If you are really wise, you'll think this over. It's time you appreciated God's deep love, the psalmist writes. How can we forget? I thought about my pastor friend when I was still a developer and the one through whom God took my first confession over the top of a car in a parking lot and Rick was, oh man, I don't think I ever heard him say anything bad about somebody and he always listened and he was that awful perfect pastor that I despise. How can I ever forget him? God through him heard my cry and lifted me out of the pit gave me a new life and a new calling. I could never, for, and, and this was just, I mean, God did it, but I can't ever imagine forgetting who Rick is in my life, let alone forgetting the God who saved you. The commandments are given in the context, behave this way, live this way, because God saved you. He took the Israelites out of Egypt, out of slavery. He saved them. There are words of wisdom offered to people who've just had their bacon saved, their lives saved, their future. Eternally, you've been saved. How can you forget? How can I forget? I am the I am God, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of a life of slavery. God saves you, all of you.
God doesn't just want to save this, however you define it, spiritual part of you that is your soul. God wants to save every thought Jean Viev has. <laughs> wants to make everyone new. God wants to save your eyes and your mouth and your ears and your relational capacities and your loves and your desires and your yearnings and every action and every step into every place and all that you do is saved in, through, and for Jesus Christ. Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, anything that is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. He saves every bit of your ordinary sleeping, eating, going to work, comedy watching, parenting, loving your husband, saving a life, singing a song, being an artist, teaching a student, running a business, life. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. I mean, Jesus was totally in there totally maintained the holiness, was in every way like us, but didn't sin, so you could still be totally there, but not succumb to where it's broken. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what He wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its own level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. I'm speaking to you out of deep gratitude for all that God has given to me, and especially as I have responsibilities in relation to you. Living then, as every one of you does, in, in pure grace, it's important that you do not misinterpret yourselves as people who are bringing this goodness to God. No, God brings it all to you. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is, His name, and by what He does for us, His name manifest in Christ not by what we are and what we do for Him. Let's pray. It is a most awkward and yet glorious place to stand, God. A busted totally aware of our inability to do what is right, our insatiable ability to make poor choices and go to places we ought not. To, to know that reality fully, even as we know all those things we just heard about how you see us, and will never leave us or forsake us and love us and forgive us and offer us new life. I mean, the connection between the two is so profound and living with both equally ineffable, mysterious beyond us. Help us to uh, never forget who you are and what you've done 
and what you've given us in Jesus Christ. Help us to never let go of the fact that he is with us by his spirit, a comforter, a convictor, a shepherd, a guide, the wisdom of God given to a mere mortal human being. Help us to never forget that you made everything. So when we talk about everything, everywhere, we're, we're trading on your creation, language, the biology of hearing and touch and place. This is your world that we are uh, living in and walking into and eating and sleeping in. Help us to not forget that, to not forget you, and to, as much as we can, bring honor and glory and praise to your name, we pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen.